Uh, to all the members of the Board of Trustees, honored guests, faculty, staff, parents, families, and graduates, I really am excited to be here to celebrate the LaRoche College class of 2016. To the graduates, um, I want to say congratulations on a job well done. To your family and friends, I want to say thank you. Your unwavering love, support, and sacrifice have made today possible. So I'm going to ask the graduates to stand up and clap for your family and friends and thank them for all the support they've given you here over the years. To uh, Anna and Greer, and particularly to the guy who's yelling for Greer, that was some nice energy in the back of the room. That was excellent. There you go. I'd like to take you on the road with me. It was fun. Uh, I'm so happy to be here, uh, sister, with you and everyone. Um, I'm from a big Irish Catholic family. And when you get a great uh, honor like this, the first thing you do when you're from a competitive family is you call up your siblings to rub it in a little bit, right? So I called up my sister Maria. And I said, you're not going to believe it. I've been asked by Sister Candace to go up and get an award from LaRoche College. The class of 2016 is graduating. It's in Pittsburgh. I have so many friends from Pittsburgh. What an honor. She said, are you kidding me? Sister Candace called me last week and asked me to give the speech. <laughs> and I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, well, you know, I've written four or five bestsellers. I'm on national television. I have four kids. You have three kids. So I hung up on Maria. So I called, sister, I can't believe I caught you doing this too. And then I called my brother Timmy, who runs Special Olympics. And I said, Timmy, listen, I've been asked by Sister Candace. I called up Maria, and she said that Sister Candace had called her before. I said, do you think Maria's lying? And Timmy said, I don't know, but I got a message here to call Sister Candace. Um, so I don't know if I'm the third driver or the fourth driver to be asked, but I'm honored to be here. So, um, thank you, sister. I actually made that all up. Um, I'm sure if you would ask my sister or brothers, they'd all be happy to be here. So I will tell you, I do love Pittsburgh. I have friends that went to a Central Catholic. My mother and father were great friends with the Roonies, uh, Rocky Blyer, um, Franco Harris, all did Special Olympics work when I was a kid. Um, and it really is good to be here. I'll tell you one thing, uh, sister mentioned uh, this book I wrote on my dad. So I got asked to, uh, go down to Houston, Texas to speak uh, by, uh, with Barbara Bush, uh, 2,000 people about the book I wrote to my father. And I'm feeling pretty good. I have lunch with the Bush family. President Bush is there. Governor Bush is there. And they're all telling me how great the book is. Everybody else who's an author is the number one best-selling author. And then there's me. But I'm feeling pretty good. So I get back to the hotel just before the speech and I walk into the elevator. And this guy comes in after me, and he's got the big cowboy hat on and the cowboy boots. And he looks at me and he goes, mm, anybody ever told you you look like a Kennedy? Um, and I said, well, sometimes. And the guy goes, mm, that must make you so mad. Um, so I'm happy to be here in Pittsburgh. Um, happy to be in Pittsburgh. So uh, my oldest friend told me, look, keep your speech to eight minutes. And those Red Hawks are ready to party, so I'm gonna bring, make this very short. You've had some great graduation speakers here, Charlie Batch, Martin Sheehan, Joyce Rothermel. When Sister called me up and asked me whether I'd do this, I actually thought, why was I asked to speak? I'd like to think it had something to do with my work in the Maryland Legislature, or my work with the Choice Program, working with juvenile delinquent kids, or my work at Save the Children for the last 13 years, but I know I was chosen mostly because of the book I wrote on my father, and this book that I'm just finishing up on Pope Francis, and the lessons that I've learned from those two men, and from a couple of other role models, my mother and my mother-in-law. You know, I wrote the book on my father after he died. He died about 18 months after my mom, and I wanted to figure out why he was so joyful. So I went back and read the letters that he wrote me almost every day of my life, and wanted to figure out what it meant to be good, because that's what the people who waited in line at his funeral told me he was. Not great for having created the Peace Corps, the Job Corps, Legal Services, Head Start, Community Action, but really because of his faith and his goodness. And when I traveled to Buenos Aires and to Argentina to learn about Pope Francis and met with his colleagues and friends, when I read his homilies and the books about him, it's his faith that stands out, just as it was for my dad. 
And the same is true for my mother, who was a daily communicant, and my mother-in-law, Libby Scruggs, who lived in Knoxville, Tennessee. Their lives were grounded in their faith, and their faith demanded daily acts of hope and love, daily acts of serving others, especially children and the poor, the forgotten, the voiceless, and learning from them as well. And those acts were grounded in humility and in mercy. So when I looked at the people that I admired most, people who were truly successful, not necessarily the richest or the most famous, but people who are truly joy-filled, their lives are built on those same pillars, faith and a faith that demands acts of hope and love, humility and mercy. My father, I'll just give you a couple quick stories. My father worked very closely with Martin Luther King in the 50s, and he, when my uncle, uh, then Senator Kennedy, was running for president, my father uh, reached out to uh, Uncle Jack and said, look, you should call Coretta Scott King, because Martin Luther King had been arrested a couple of weeks before the election. And everybody thought that that was a bad idea, that that would throw the Democratic Party to the Republicans, especially in the Deep South. But my father convinced then Senator Kennedy to call Coretta Scott King. They had a very short conversation, and after it was over, the Civil Rights Division was closed down. The Civil Rights Division within the campaign was closed down. My father got yelled at. But the African-American votes shifted in that campaign to such a degree that most people think that that's what got Senator Kennedy elected president. That one gesture to reach out to Mrs. King made the huge difference. And some have said that it was a great political move, but I really think it was an act of hope. Here was a guy who was raised, whose family had fought in both the North and the South in the Civil War. I think he thought that if President Kennedy were to get elected, and were to make a gesture to Coretta Scott King that that might start to heal some of the racial wounds in this country. Pope Francis, you see, um, when I went down to Buenos Aires, I met his, one of his best friends, who amazingly enough is a trash collector in Buenos Aires. Went down and talked to this man, Sergio Sanchez, for a couple of hours. The Pope has baptized his children. The Pope has spent time with him in the slums of Buenos Aires and with the other trash collectors. Talk about acts of mercy and humility. My mother, spending so much time with her sister who was developmentally disabled, Rosemary, who would then end up being the inspiration for starting Special Olympics. And my mother-in-law spending her entire life raising seven kids, giving them unconditional love, and doing it under dire circumstances when her husband died when the youngest, my wife, was only four years of age. So I'm sure you're all sitting here wondering what these stories of faith and hope and love have to do with us gathered here in Pittsburgh on this beautiful day. You know, many universities and colleges don't talk about faith. They don't talk about God. They surely don't give awards every year to nuns. A number of years ago, the president of Harvard said that the real mission of a university was the discovery and transmission of knowledge, not to improve society in specific ways. But right there is why the heart of LaRoche and you are different. LaRoche is fully committed to academic excellence, but the college's mission includes fostering global citizens to promote justice and peace in a constantly changing world. Citizens who can think and act and are committed to service. This college has prepared you with a great education, but it's also taught you that you cannot be morally neutral that there's no way that you can claim the morally good life is not the ultimate purpose of the informed life. Over and over again, in the future, you will be faced with circumstances in which freedom and opportunity for others are being denied or compromised. Individualism and consumerism will invite you to look their way, to focus exclusively on your needs and your desires. Will you accept that invitation, or will you accept the invitation that LaRoche has presented to you to have a deeper personal relationship with God, to have faith, and to put that faith into action serving others. A few years ago, the Pulitzer Prize winner, Anna Quinlan, told the graduates of Villanova, get a life, not a real life, not a maniac pursuit of the next promotion, a bigger paycheck, or the larger house. Anna Quinlan was correct, but I propose you can't get a life even if you're doing so-called do good deeds, if it's just you trying to do it on your own. You have to make God the center of all of your work. If you do, I think you're really going to find joy. You won't necessarily be happy every day, 
but you will, and you may not be rich and famous, but you will find joy. Mother Teresa said it beautifully. Every act of love is a prayer. Prayer in action and love in action is service. When Mother Teresa and her sisters fed the hungry, they were praying. When they took care of a leper, they were praying. Not with words, but with their hearts, with their hands, with their selflessness. Does such faith demand acts of hope and love like becoming Pope and being friends with the garbage man? Does it require in creating massive movements like the Peace Corps, Head Start, or Special Olympics, or taking care of lepers or raising seven children? I hope not. I've worked in the Baltimore City for six years working with juvenile delinquents trying to help them get their lives back on track, to get an education and get a decent paying job. My work at Save the Children, working with kids from zero to five, all across America and abroad with the six million kids who die every year before their fifth birthday. These are acts of hope and love that surely are not on the same scale of what Pope Francis has done or what he continues to do, what my parents or my mother-in-law did, or what Mother Teresa did, but that's just fine. Each person here in this room can commit acts of hope and love in profoundly different ways. Being kind to your brothers and sisters, being kind to the folks who are gonna clean your office, loving and forgiving each other unconditionally, saying may I, thank you, and I'm sorry, as Pope Francis has encouraged us to do. These really seemingly small gestures build the foundation of the relationship with God. So if you really believe that God is in every person in every interaction, that God does not play favorites, if you believe that each of your actions is a way to develop a closer relationship with God, that is so exciting. It's no wonder that every one of my role models was fired up every day to go to work. That energy they had came from their relationship with God. They were trying in their own ways to heed the gospel's call to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to shelter the homeless, or as our Jewish friends say, to kun alum, to repair the world. They understood that the ultimate goal is not money and fame and fortune, not the things we so often associate with greatness. No, being faithful and trying to do good, that is the ultimate goal. There's an old saying in my family made popular by President Kennedy. It's a passage from Luke. To whom much is given, much is required. It speaks of obligation. I much prefer St. Francis's invitation. It isn't giving that we receive. Acts of love and hope, they're all giving gestures. They are, as Mother Teresa said, prayers, in which we receive back gifts of mercy and humility and joy that aren't available in any school book, even those here at LaRoche College. With all my heart, I hope you will accept LaRoche's invitation to co-create a world of compassion and justice and peace in the tradition of the Congregation of Divine Providence throughout your lives. When you accept that invitation, you might be ridiculed, you might be ostracized, you surely won't have the biggest bank account or the biggest house but you will be fulfilling the words of Pope Francis when he said, sometimes we're tempted to find excuses and complain, acting as if we could only be happy if a thousand conditions were met. To some extent, this is because, Pope Francis said, our technological society has succeeded in multiplying occasions of pleasure, yet has found it difficult to engender joy. I can say that the most beautiful and natural expressions of joy which I have seen in my life were in poor people who had little to hold on to. I also think of the real joy shown by others who, even amid pressing professional obligations, were able to persevere in detachment and simplicity, a heart full of faith. In their own way, all of these instances of joy flow from the infinite love of God, who has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. I never tire of repeating those words of Pope Benedict which takes us to the very heart of the gospel. Being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty ideal, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and decisive direction. Good luck in your pursuit of such a joy-filled faith. Congratulations.